This is the vanguard circle of the Jewish Socialist Bund. The Jewish Socialist Bund is a continuation of the original Jewish Bund, mainly through the uh, heritage of my of my mother, who was a Jewish Bundist, and her brother, who was a Jewish Bundist partisan fighter against the Nazi occupation in the enclave in the Russian forest where the Jewish refugees from the from the ghetto went to hide and then went to serve in the Red Army or went to uh, contribute in the in the working force, like my father did as well, who was a refugee from Lublin and the shtetl of Bialki, just next to it. But <clears throat> he escaped from the Lublin ghetto, came back and got his brother out, um, who... Uh, was uh, assimilated into the uh, Kapos, became a Jewish policeman who was working for the Nazis. So my father got his younger brother out and quit that job, got him into Russia. And he was uh, anti-Zionist for Judaic reasons because he was basically following Judaism to be a pacifist and not seek a war when no war was necessary. But being a partisan was certainly part of Judaic tradition because it was a defensive war. And the criteria by which the partisans would fight and kill was in priority of one, two, three. One, the officers of the Nazi German invading force. Two, the Nazi soldiers who were... Uh, shooting, and three, any informers that led to the deaths of those people that they had informed upon. Now, what the Zionists are doing has nothing to do with that. They have no ethical considerations whatsoever, no moral considerations on the Judaic tradition, because they are not Jewish. They are Zionists. And the distinction has to be further and fully explained. The Jewish Bund can do that whereas the assimilated Marxist Jewish population cannot because they're denying their Jewish identity to begin with. So they can't very well criticize the Zionists for abandoning their Jewish identity. And secondly, not even being able to explain what a Jewish identity is because they abandoned that identity since 200 years now in the Marxist tradition. So... At sunset this evening, this is the uh, uh, Shabbos menorah provided by the Jewish Bunda chapter in Toronto, where I grew up. And my parents were both members of the Vorshava Lodja Mutual Benefit Society. Vorshava Lodja meaning the Warsaw Ghetto and the Lodge Ghetto, which were um, merged in the Warsaw Ghetto. And all of those refugees who survived, mainly by escaping into the Soviet Union, uh, had an association which was very quiet, very personal, sort of underground, you might say. And it was um, basically led by the Jewish Bundes. And I was the uh, primary activist of that association. And I became much more active when I met the Trotskyists, and they allowed me to continue my Bundist activities while being a member. Until we had to split because they didn't know what they had to do about the Social Democratic Labour Party, and they didn't know what to do about uh, U.S. economic domination of Canada as a dependency. So they had no methodology by which to analyze and come to a consensual opinion. They just broke down into various doctrinaire accusations. So we left, formed a new association, which was very successful in electing United Left Slate at York University, and then ended up um, falling apart because of the um, the chauvinism of the Anglo-Canadians, basically, and the uh, workers, members of that of that uh, forward group, Socialist League. 
who were actually, you know, working in war production for the United States Empire at Pratt & Whitney, providing some donations as a supposed uh, forgiveness a gesture. But it wasn't even that, you know, because they didn't even know that they had to be forgiven <laughs> or wanted to be forgiven, didn't want to be. So there's problems with the left, and we're going to get into that further when it concerns the uh, left's uh, historic uh, treatment of anti-Semitism. Now, at sundown, I'll bring this back and then light her up. Now, I have a couple things to share, and the first one is going to be some very important news about the uh, Jewish National Fund, which is the collection agency or the taxing agency in Canada and the United States and elsewhere. And uh, it is a charitable organization that provides for uh, a considerable reduction in income tax to be paid based upon the contribution made to this charitable organization. So money was being sent to the charitable organization, which was being used to provide for some military means, actually. And for that reason, it was just unregistered. Huh. And we've been fighting for that for a long time. And this is after uh, our own or charitable organization, La Galerie Focus, F-O-K-U-S, had been collecting donations for Gush Shalom in uh, occupied 48 Palestine. And that Israeli group was in favor of recognizing the Palestine state and helped to lead to the uh, Oslo Agreement. And they were the first with uh, Uri Davis, the founder. And so they cut uh, uh, off those charitable donations by deregistering our charitable organization, which was sponsoring those designated charities, charitable donations. So, so now I'm going to show you <clears throat> and here it is. See Canada revoking Jewish National Fund, Canada charitable status. JNF says motive anti-Semitic. Well, of course. <laughs> but it's been uh, in the works, you know, for years and years and years. And a number of campaigns that was started by Dr. Uri Davis here in Canada, actually, when he first campaigned and did a speaking tour, speaking out against the Jewish National Fund as a Zionist organization and backing up the military and even making use of occupied territories from the West Bank in what's called Canada Park, which I visited with him. Now, the JNF suggested that anti-Zionist or anti-Semitic motives within the ranks of CRA, Canada Revenue Agency, may have influenced the decision. May, may have influenced the decision. Well, if they have proof, you know, present it, you know, because they intend to, <laughs> intend to sue, you know, appeal the decision to the Federal Court of Appeal. But if they say here right away, you know, they may have influenced, well, you know, they don't have any proof, so they're going to lose. <laughs> the Canada Revenue Agency notified the Jewish National Fund of Canada that it was revoking the organization's charitable status because the government body did find its original 1967 main charitable object unacceptable, the JNF said in a statement and newsletter on Thursday. Chain of Canada National President Nathan Diesenhaus and CEO Lance Davis announced in a statement dated Wednesday and published Thursday that they had launched a legal challenge against CRA with the Federal Court of Appeal. Yeah, well, I did an appeal to the Federal Court of Appeal as well on behalf of our <clears throat> designated charity, charities and charitable donations to the Gashalom, but they refused to consider it. You know, they will not rule against the Canada Revenue Agency. CRA was reportedly making its decision based off a 2014 audit, and JNF said that it was unjust that after five issueless audits and accepting the original charitable objective decades ago, charitable status was now being revoked. Uh, well, I guess politics has changed. You know, like, wake up, people. Okay, now... Oh. The bulk of what I want to talk to you about today is this new book that has come out. It's uh, available in digital format here at academia.edu. 
It's called The Socialist Response to Antisemitism in Imperial Germany, New York. Cambridge University Press, 2007. Uh -huh. I don't know how I didn't find this before. The Socialist Response to Antisemitism in Imperial Germany. Now this is getting down into the real nature of the left's position on one, Jewish identity, and two, Zionism. First, the left was very much taken in by Zionism, especially the communist parties, except for the Trotskyists. And even the anarchists in Montreal here, you know, like Murray Butchkin were pro-Zionist. At one point, you know, he even ordered me not to go to visit Tripoli. Anyways, so this is a topic that has to be examined in detail and seriously. And nobody from a Marxist standpoint is going to tell me that, you know, if they have made no mistakes. If they say that, you know, then they have just declared themselves to be a worthless, uh, <clears throat> a worthless element. Not even human. Okay, what sets anti-Semites apart from anti-Semites in Imperial Germany was, no. What sets anti-Semites apart from anti-anti-Semites in Imperial Germany was not so much what they thought about the Jews, but what they thought should be done about them. Uh, Anti-anti-Semites, you know, like, why not try anti-Judeophobia? Okay, never mind. Uh, okay. Like most anti-Semites, German Social Democrats... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't bring the microphone over here. Like most anti-Semites, German Social Democrats felt that the anti-Semites had a point, but took matters too far. Hmm. In fact, socialist anti-Semitism often did not hinge on the anti-Semites' anti-Jewish orientation at all. Sorry. Socialist anti-anti-Semitism often did not hinge on the anti-Semites' anti-Jewish orientation at all, as if they just accepted that as fact. Even when it did, the socialists' arguments generally did more to consolidate than to subvert generally accepted notions regarding the Jews. And it's a good thing that they're in in uh, Guimet there, in, in quotation marks, because the Jews is a term that is used to insult Jewish people. It's like saying the Negroes. It's objectifying uh, people. It treats people as a uh, object. It is not a name. It is an object, as if it was a material entity without any human qualities, as if it wasn't a conscious human being, the Jews, as if it was some kind of an animal. Okay, and oftentimes it is compared to insects. To continue, so what do you do, you know, like you talk about Jewish people, that's all. I'm Jewish, I'm not a Jew. Anybody who calls me a Jew is asking for a fight. Okay. By focusing on a broader set of perceptions accepted by both anti-Semites and anti-anti-Semites and drawing a variety of new sources into the debate, this study offers a startling reinterpretation of seemingly well-rehearsed issues, including the influence of Karl Marx's Zer Judenfrage on the Jewish question and the positions of various leading social democrats. Franz Mehring, Edward Bernstein, August Bebel, Wilhelm Liebnick, Karl Kautsky, Rosa Luxemburg, and their peers. Now, the writer is Lars Fischer. He began with a BA in modern history with first class honors, okay, from Queen Mary and Westfield College, University of London, and a PhD in 2003 from University College London, where he is a lecturer in German history and in the German department, an honorary research fellow in the Hebrew and Jewish studies department. So he probably knows German. So this is going to be a very sort of penetrating study. 
because he's going into German sources. He previously held a lectureship in modern European history at King's College, London. This is his first book. Wow. Marvelous. The Socialist Response to Anti-Semitism in Imperial Germany. Lars Fischer, University College, London. From Cambridge University Press. <clears throat> Okay, here's the contents. Can I have a look at this? Influence of the Judenfrage on the socialist movement. Yeah, Marx's influence on this, on the matter of Jewish identity is predominant. Uses of the Judenfrage. Social Democratic Party of 1903 when the split happened between the Jewish Bund and the Communists and the Mensheviks. Very interesting. The former anti-Semite lutes on anti-Semitism and the Jewish question. Anti-Semitism and the Jewish question in Dresden, Arden, Liebnick, Party Congress. The evolution of Bernstein's stand on anti-Semitism and the Jewish question. Bernstein's dispute with Bax. Never heard of the guy. Bernstein. Eleanor Marx, Mazinger, Bernstein, shift in Bernstein's emphasis during the war, Mehring versus Bernstein. Okay, you know, this stuff we've never heard talked about before. Okay, let's talk about it now. Okay. Now, let me uh, take a pause here with you. Okay. So let's continue with the book because we have to do a critique of the left, critique of Marxism, critique of anarchism, critique of all the other doctrines that don't even mention the Jewish question. The problem being that there is no Jewish question. What does that mean? What does Marx mean by the Jewish question? Question of what? Existence of the Jewish people? No. no. Couldn't mean that. What does it mean? Question of Jewish identity. So you can no longer be a Jewish person if you happen to be Marxist or leftist. You're not supposed to be Jewish anymore. Is that what it's all about? Let's see. Let's see what the analysis of the left in the most crucial of contexts in Germany, Imperial Germany, and find out <clears throat> what it's all about. The real nitty-gritty of, of leftism. And here we go. Like most scholarly inquiry, this book wants to contribute to our understanding of questions that extend <clears throat> beyond its immediate remit or action. To indicate where I think the wider implication of this book lie, and to make it easier for the reader to understand my approach, I want to begin by explaining what the bigger questions were that guided me while undertaking the research for this book and trying to make sense of my findings. Any attempt to gauge and interpret current expressions of anti-Semitism and to determine how best to contain and oppose them is invariably to a considerable degree, dependent on our notions of historical precedent. Some of the most urgent and controversial relevant issues are currently these. Is the anti-Semitism of Islamicist and jihadic ideology <clears throat> inherent in its traditional roots and sources, or ultimately an import from the ideological arsenal of Western modernity? Second question, is the political left in the West responding adequately to contemporary anti-Semitism? To what extent is its response indicative of an already established tradition of problematic dealings with anti-Semitism and the Jews? 
To be sure, comparison with anti-Semitism's historical track record and past attempts to counter it are not our only means of assessing current risks and realities and determining suitable strategies to confront them. Okay, now we're getting into Bundestag. It is obvious, though, that historical precedent will always play a prominent role in this process. Consequently, the historical development dynamics of modern anti-Semitism and the experience of those who opposed it in the past, apart from being a matter of historical interest, are also issues of considerable contemporary import. Yet, if what we take to be historical precedent is in fact based on a misreading of previous encounters between anti-Semitism and anti-anti-Semitism, then the conclusions we draw from that ostensible precedent will invariably be skewed, leaving us ill-equipped to meet contemporary challenges. The socialist response to anti-Semitism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, as exemplified by the endeavors of imperial German social democracy, is one such encounter between anti-Semitism and anti-anti-Semitism that scholars have misinterpreted in a number of significant ways. In the first instance, my interest is obviously to set the record straight on the ways in which imperial German social democrats grappled with anti-Semitism. Hopefully, though, the approach I have developed to do so is one that colleagues working on other comparable encounters and on relations between Jews and non-Jews more generally will also find useful in refining their analysis. This Jews and non-Jews bit. I fully concur with Adorno's, our Adorno's uh, contention that Auschwitz has established a new categorical imperative that compels mankind to undertake everything within its power to ensure that nothing comparable to the Shoah can reoccur. If we are to take this imperative seriously, we initially need to understand that the conditions actually were that facilitated the perpetuation of the Shoah in the first place. It is this task that informed my decision to become a historian and that ultimately lies at the heart of all my academic endeavors. Sounds like me. He must be a second generation Holocaust survivor. How it was possible for a highly developed European society to commit genocide in the way German society did during the Shoah in German soil, on German soil, in Europe, is a question that continues to vex and haunt many of those engaged in the study of the Shoah, of national show socialism, and modern German history more generally. You know, because there was, you know, a Holocaust started in Namibia by German colonialism. The question is, how could this actually happen in Europe itself? It is an issue that has been riddled with controversy, both scholarly and polemical. What allowed Daniel Goldhagen to cause such a stir with his willing ex executioners in 1996 was the emphatic way in which he placed anti-Semitism squarely at the heart of his explanation of the Shoah and insisted on the primacy of anti-Semitism as the main motive force behind it. His approach broke radically with a false dichotomy that the long-standing controversy between the internationalist and structuralist interpretations of National Socialism and the Holocaust had previously established. The intentionalists emphasized the significance of anti-Semitism as the, or at least, a central motive force underlying the Shoah, the Holocaust, I mean. Yet, they located the intention to exterminate Jewry almost exclusively with the Nazi, Nazi elites and pro, pro, portrayed its implementation as an imposed top-down process in which German society as a whole collaborated only reluctantly and almost entirely under duress. So I need my glasses. The structuralist model, by contrast, redirected the focus towards the activities and experiences not only of the entire state and military apparatus, but also of German society more generally. The complex and very 
variegated picture of the Shoah's perpetuation that consequently emerged invariably made the issue of the motor forces driving and facil facilitating the Shoah a more complex and variegated issue too. This presents a real enough challenge, of course, but there can be little doubt that some historians, most notably perhaps Hans Momensen, Momsen, pursued the structuralist path from the outset with the intention of dislodging anti-Semitism from its central role in any explanation of the Shoah. Instead, a form of discourse increasingly emerged that, as al Wahan has put it rather aptly, discuss, discusses the Shoah as if a reconstruction of the means by which the per per perpetuator acquired the murder weapon already offered a comprehensive explanation of the reasons for the murder. Yet, of what relevance are potential means and opportunity where there is no motive. In fact, without such a motive, they cease to be means and opportunity and simply revert to being straightforward circumstances. Goldhagen sought not only to reassert anti-Semitism as the crucial point of departure for any explanation of the Shoah, he also tried to do so in a way com compatible with the notion of extensive societal responsibility for its perpetuation. The Shoah was not only the intentional realization of an ideologically motivated project, but this was a project, he argued, that the bulk of German society subs subscribed to, and it did so with considerable enthusiasm, enthusiasm at that. Oh boy, true. Only over time did it become clear to his supporters and detractors in the public forum that Goldhagen had in fact entered into a zero-sum game. The strong continuity he ascribed to eliminationist anti-Semitism in German society prior to the Shoah was complemented by an equally radical but quite inexplicable discontinuity in its aftermath. Almost overnight, the specter of democratic re-education had apparently beaten the eliminationist anti-Semitism previously integral to the makeup of German society for centuries into retreat. As Goldhagen made this assumption more explicit, it became clear that the preparedness to engage his stark portrayal of societal implication in the perpetuation of the Shoah was in effect a cathartic exercise, rewarded with a clean bill of health for post-war German society. Thus, the public debate soon sailed into steadier waters and Goldhagen turned from a bogeyman to a highly decorated pet. <laughs> the problem being that after the Holocaust, German society was not denazified. The Nazis continued their place in the courts as judges. The Nazis continued their place as diplomats in the embassies. And the Nazis continued their place in the United Nations, even, as Secretary General, as well time turned out to be. And as, as sought-after scientists in the United States in its competition with the USSR. The problem with Goldhagen's explanatory model is no, not so much that its portrayal of the implication of much of German society and the perpetuation of the Shoah is unduly stark or bleak. In this respect, the merits of his book remain considerable. The real problems lie elsewhere. In granting post-war German society a clean bill of health, Goldhagen not only legitimatized the increasingly aggressive calls to draw a final line between the critical examination of German society developed after 1945 to deal with that responsibility. Yet, in other words, it wasn't denazified. Yet the bulk of these strategies, in fact, did more to minimize and evade than to explain and address the implication of much of German society in the Shoah. Aha. More importantly for our context here, however, his exclusive focus on the alleged continuity of eliminationist, eliminationist anti-Semitism in German society prior to the Shoah is a reductionist one that loves, grossly oversimplifies the questions he claims to answer. The suggestion that most Germans were rabid anti-Semites hell-bent from the outset on physically annihilating the Jews 
only detracts from the issues that need to be engaged if we genuinely want to understand and acknowledge German society's actual, indeed extensive and horrendous implication in the perpetuation of the Shoah. What we really need to understand is why the physical annihilation of the Jews struck a sufficient cross-section of the German population as a plausible and feasible solution to the supposedly real existing problem. Why did the measures leading up to it not disquiet the bulk of German society sufficiently to stop the escalation towards this solution in its tracks? It is often said that the chief responsibility of most Germans for the Shoah lay in their indifference. Perhaps many Germans did feel fairly indifferent towards the act of genocide itself. Huh. Reminds me of the current genocide in Gaza and the complicity and the indifference going on of many Jewish people of the older generations here within 48 Palestine. <clears throat> well, it's worse than that. They're enthusiastically going for it. They want more genocide, not less. Well, not all, just 70%. Okay, some of them may genuinely not have realized what was going on. Many chose not to know, either by failing to inquire, even when developments before their own eyes or reports they received from sources they trusted clearly begged their question, or simply by willfully ignoring what was in fact blatantly obvious. The vast majority probably had a response reasonably good idea of what was going on, even if their knowledge of the precise details was patchy. Yet, however great the role may have been, that indifference played in these various responses to the act of genocide itself, indifferent towards the Jews, the Germans most certainly were not. Virtually all Germans subscribed to a basic set of anti-Jewish stereotypes and the conviction that an unresolved Jewish question is more or less urgent need of a comprehensive solution that existed. To be sure, subjectively, it sounds like he's talking about Karl Marx. To be sure, subjectively, most of them were presumably convinced that all they wanted to do, all they wanted was to see the situation of the Jews normalized once and for all. The Jews needed to be put in their place and the alleged issues of their undue influence and their inclination to subvert accepted values required a definitive resolution. The Jews had been granted emancipation on the condition that they assimilate, yet they had done so only partially or opportunistically, or even worse, in order to mask the ways in which they continued to maintain their own, specifically Jewish interests. Hence, Sturdier measures than politicians had previously dared apply were presumably called for to guarantee that the Jewish question really was satisfactorily resolved. We should not forget that for many Germans, National Socialism's preparedness to implement radical solutions that all previous politicians had shied away from was, in any case, one of its main attractions. Great time. Okay, that was a break for me. Now we can continue. And mm -hmm. oh, Trishka. Oh, yes, I've read all of this European political philosophy for my thesis. And it is incredible how much anti-Semitism there is in the history of Europe. So the Holocaust didn't come from nothing. Yes, this is what is being explained here. Yet, this edifice of stereotypes, an edifice built over like 2,000 years, and the entire discourse, that is, you know, since the foundation of Christianity. Not Christianity in the indigenous sense of the Orient, but Christianity in terms of the Roman Empire. This edifice of stereotypes and the entire discourse 
on the claims and limitations of Jewish assimilation were in large part predicted on assumptions. Oh, no, it was in large part predicated on assumptions whose underlying logic implied that the Jews were not generally capable of assimilating fully. In this respect, the godfather of respectable anti-Semitism, the leading imperial German historian and national liberal deputy in the Reichstag, Heinrich von Trischke, 1834-1896, really, that late, had already set the standard in the late 1870s. When it came to formulating what he thought the practical consequences of his analysis of the Jewish question should be, he did no more than appeal to Jewry to show more modesty and to assimilate more thoroughly. Yet the main body of his analysis not only allowed for no other conclusion than that the Jews were in fact intrinsically incapable of assimilating, but it also implied that the existence of unassimilated elements within its sphere posed a threat to the very existence of the German nation that it could not in the long run afford to tolerate. Now, it is no foregone conclusion that people will draw the implication of their beliefs. Oh yes, there is an assumption being made by Trischke that there is a homogeneous uh, identity to the German nation, when in fact there were various German nationalities that unified under a state that called itself a nation state, but it was not homogeneous. Now, it is no foregone conclusion that people draw the implications of their beliefs and convictions to their logical conclusion, logical consequence, let alone that they will attempt to implement those logical consequences. Many of the remarks and statements we will encounter were made in the political arena. Often they were primarily meant to score points rather than add up to a conceptually consistent alternative position. Whether they genuinely question the generally established terms of reference or those that one's opponents adhere to was therefore often of little or no concern to those who made these statements. Yet this in no way diminishes their ultimate responsibility for thereby helping to maintain and reproduce the prevalent discourse on anti-Semitism and the Jewish question and the exclusionary dynamics generated by that increasingly consensual discourse. It is surely fair to say that no government or regime will ever be able to mobilize sufficient popular support for genocidal policies unless these policies, in fact, represent the ultimate consequence of an exclusionary logic with which the, the society whose support is required is already saturated. Uh -huh. So this reflects on the Israeli civil society presently, because there is a popular support for genocidal policies there, and that is based upon an exclusionary logic in which there were the Jews and there were the Arabs, who weren't only just simple Arabs, they were Palestinian Arabs. And on the other side were the Jews. But amongst the Jewish people, 50% of the population are Arabs, Jewish Arabs. So all of a sudden that binary exclusionary logic doesn't work anymore. But it's ignored. That's totally ignored. As the National Socialists would have ignored the fact that the Jewish people of the East Europe were speaking a dialect of German called Yiddish, my language, which would mean by definition, according to Herder, that Jewish people were as German as any other German people, Germanic people. The National Socialists would obviously have had quite a struggle on their hands had they tried to single out all healthy, blue-eyed little girls with blonde ponytails for physical annihilation. In short, it is sustained anti-Jewish discourse that initially stops well short of explicitly drawing its own implications to their logical consequence that none, none, nevertheless helps render society susceptible to that logical consequence ultimately. It makes increasingly radical suggestions, moving, moving further and further towards that logical consequence, 
seem worthy of serious consideration because they are in keeping with well-established patterns of reflections, reflection upon the Jewish question. So, you know, 75 years of Arab bashing in Israeli Zionist society has prepared everybody for the genocide that's taking place. Okay, consequently, options that would otherwise be dismissed out of hand because they seem intolerable or untenable gain the potential to move gradually from the lunatic fringe, Zionism, to the heart of viable governmental policy, making decisions. In Imperial Germany, even the self-avowed anti-Semites rarely admitted to themselves that the logical consequence of their arguments could only be wholesale removal of the Jews from non-Jewish society. That is to say, Christian society. So uh, Germans were defining themselves by a national identity based upon a criteria of Christianity. So if you weren't Christian, you weren't Jewish, you weren't a German, and if you were Jewish, you couldn't be German, even though uh, Ger uh, Jewish people were uh, amongst the Ashkenazim of Eastern Europe as Germanic as the Germans, at least for 500 years. Uh, now, in Imperial Germany, even the self-avowed anti-Semites rarely admitted to themselves that the logical consequence of their arguments could only be the wholesale removal of the Jews from non-Jewish society, let alone that the wholesale removal might best be brought about by their physical annihilation. And this is what the Zionists are prepared to do now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hitler himself, when he began to present his emerging own brand of anti-Semitic ideology to the public immediately after the war, was no doubt that there could be no solution short of the Jews' removal. Einfernung. Einfernung. That's German. That means more than removal. That means elimination. To end with. An ending. An ending of. That's what it means. Yet he used the terms expulsion. Auswesung. Yes, to push out. And annihilation. Vernichtung. Vernich means nothing left. Annihilation. Yeah. Interchangeably. The terms were used interchangeably. Because that's what they meant. <clears throat> that annihilation would be um, the method of choice. There was no foregone conclusion then. On the other hand, it was not an option Hitler felt the need or the desire to rule out either. So, to be sure, for most Germans to adopt an apt formulation by Anthony Coders, the dream of a Germany without Jews, was by no means invariably implied, the dream of a Germany strewn with the victims of annihilation. Yet without the former, the latter could never have become reality. This dream of a future without Jews was, of course, no exclusively German phenomena. Far from it. In fact, the Zionists used the territorial slogan of a land without a people for a people without a land. All of a sudden, the Palestinians don't exist. And now they're seeking to implement that very axiom. The non-Jewish obsession with Jews and the stereotyping of the Jews as a central plank of Western identity formation have been enduring features of European civilization, so-called. This reminds me of Gandhi when he was asked about what he thought about European civilization. And he replied, well, yeah, that would be a good idea. <laughs> so true. Fortunately, not all rapt perceptions of Jewry invariably lead down some high road to genocide, but hardly merits complacency. What he means by Jewry here is the Jewish people, the Jewish people internationally. He doesn't say so. I don't know. He's got to read more Bundes literature, you know, and figure out how to talk about the Jewish identity. The degree of often willing collaboration the Germans count on throughout Europe in the implementation of the Shoah bears testimony to the destructive potential at stake here. Yeah, when the German soldiers are too squeamish, you know, to carry out the murders, then they let the Ukrainian Nazis do it for them. Or Lithuanian Nazis, or Ethiopian Nazis, or Polish Nazis, you know, nothing. Lots of Nazis around. And then the Zionists, 
who were quite willing to make deals with the Nazis as well. Even so, it was the interaction between regime and society in Germany that turned the physical annihilation of the Jews into the centerpiece of a supposedly redemptive mission and generated the determination and stamina required to see it through with such awful consequence. What we need to understand are the conditions and the mechanism that allow or compel a society to draw the logic of the stereotyping and exclusionary ideas prevalent in its mists to their ultimate consequence. Surely our attempts to do so are most likely to succeed if we focus on the specific context in which we know that mechanism to have functioned most effectively and devastatingly. National socialist anti-Semitism only stood a chance of advancing from the lunatic fringe to viable governmental policy because German society was saturated with a set of perceptions regarding the Jews, whose implications, when taken to their ultimate logical consequence, made options that would otherwise have seen plain mad appear plausible. These options struck many as daring and revolutionary, to be sure, but they nevertheless seemed plausible enough to deserve support, support that was perhaps unconditional, but more likely conditional. Perhaps it was merely tacit, tacit, but it was support all the same, and there was enough of it to render the perpetuation of the show of viable. <sighs> the purpose of this book is to help us understand the process of societal saturation with the perceptions of the Jewish question that underpinned this development by throwing a light on the extent to which both self-avowed anti-Semites and those opposed to political anti-Semitism in Imperial Germany subscribe to many of the same anti-Jewish stereotypes. He's talking about the left. So the left allowed it to happen because they were indoctrinated with anti-Semitism. You know, like the Stalin-Hitler pact, you know, Rubentrop-Molotov pact, after they dumped the Jewish uh, um, Soviet ambassador in Britain and Molotov took over to make friends with Hitler. Oh yeah, sure. Until 27,000, no, 27 million Russians were killed. Congratulations, your pact worked for Hitler. On the whole, what set those who did consider themselves anti-Semites apart from those who did not was not primarily, not primarily that they thought there was a problem with the Jews, or even in large me measure what they thought that problem was. In this respect, most contemporaries tended to agree to a startling degree. What set them apart was what they thought should be done to resolve the ostensible problem. In other words, it was their prescriptions for the Jewish question rather than their perceptions of it that set them apart. He's talking about the left. Given the extent to which the alleged problem was imagined rather than real, it could never actually have been resolved in keeping with the widely accepted terms of reference. Yeah, how can you solve a problem that doesn't exist in the first place? Let alone could the underlying rival versions of a pluralist society or... An... Oh, let me take a break now. Got a call. Okay, we continue here. Since it's sundown right now, we should uh, start to light the uh, Shabbos candles. And here they are in the Jewish Bundes Menorah. And here we go. First we say the, uh, the blessing, and then we light the candles. No, we light the candles, no, no. I think that was first. And the way it said is this Baruch Atan Atunai Elohinu Melech Halom Shikol Mia Bidfra. Shabbos. 
you know, let's go back to this very important work. Because we can't get anywhere dealing with Zionism if we don't understand this predicament. The predicament of uh, anti-Semitism in the left. The left has failed to resolve the Jewish question, so-called, and therefore it has resulted in Zionism as a reaction. So we have to critique the left's failure in order to find a way to deal with Zionism. And that was already done by the Bundes movement. And the left has not become conscious of the contribution of Bundism. And in fact, the split of 1903 is still in effect. So now we're going to overcome that. Okay. Now we go to share again. Given the extent to which the alleged problem was imagined rather than real, to say the least, could never actually have been resolved in keeping with the widely accepted terms of reference, as I mentioned previously. Since the Jewish question was no genuine conflict capable of genuine resolution, it had an inbuilt, virtually boundless potential for escalation. The more one des desired its amicable resolution, the more its inevitable failure to materialize would intens intensify the sense of frustration and futility felt even by those who subjectively wished the Jews no harm. Yeah. Short of acknowledging that the Jewish question did not in fact exist, even those with the best intentions and, and eventually had to concede that more radical measures would apparently be required to resolve the issue than they had ever envisaged, envisaged at the outset. So in other words, you know, like, that they require Jewish people not to be Jewish and to assimilate into becoming Americans or whatever, into becoming Germans. Well, you know, like, how are you supposed to do that? By becoming a Christian? Yes, and adopting Christian parents? <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Prima facie. It might well seem that a world that could be neatly divided into anti-Semites and non-anti-Semites would make our task inordinately easier. Yet, as far as the situation in Imperial Germany is, Germany is concerned, matters are far more complicated, and a seemingly so tempting, clear-cut juxtaposition of anti-Semites and non-anti-Semites can seriously impede our comprehension of the issues at stake. It forces us to portray in black and white a constellation actually characterized by various very murky shades of gray. It is more than evident that imperial German society was pervaded by a set of perceptions regarding the Jews that was more problematic in its own right without necessarily amounting to fully blown anti-Semitism. Shalomit Volkov has suggested that anti-Semitism was transmitted from Imperial Germany to the Weimar period, not so much via a direct continuity of organized political anti-Semitism or explicitly anti-Semitic ideology, but primarily through the persistence of a cultural system of norms, vocabulary, and associations. Yeah, that's why it's wrong to refer to Jewish people as Jews, because that's like a sack of individual Jews. But the Jewish people is something else. You know, it's a people nation, entirely different. In fact, the opposite. The term the Jews, you know, refers to an assimilationist perspective, that the problem is that there are these Jews, that each individual Jew has a responsibility of assimilating. And if they don't, then they get punished. Okay through the persistence of cultural systems of norms, vocabulary, and associations, like Christianity. I don't know why it doesn't say that. That were, for the most part, not avowedly anti-Semitic. If we take this contention seriously, it immediately becomes evident that it is precisely the shades of gray that are of the utmost importance for our understanding of this process of transmission. It is they that ultimately formed the prevalent set of perceptions regarding the Jews in imperial German society. 
and this more general set of perceptions, in turn, clearly did more in the long run to render German society susceptible to national socialist anti-Semitism than the ideological or organizational continuity, continuity of pre-war political anti-Semitism in its own right. If we limit ourselves, in other words, you know, the Catholic Church, you know, which was in it, the anti-Semitic institution previously, uh, was not sufficient in and of itself, you know, to create the Holocaust. It had to be based upon cultural norms that uh, were nurtured by Christianity, but uh, can be best described as national chauvinism, even though it's not national, because the Jewish people were as German as anybody else who was German. If we limit ourselves to the more straightforward juxtaposition of anti-Semites and non-anti-Semites, we are invariably compelled either to demonize this entire spectrum of problematic perceptions by classifying them as anti-Semitic or to exculpate them altogether by qualifying them as non-anti-Semitic. Either way, we impede our ability to understand the dynamics and significance of these perceptions with the process rendering German society capable of the perpetuation of the Holocaust. Therefore, it is precisely on these shades of gray that this book will primarily focus. Aha! Yeah, shades of gray in the left. More specifically, it will examine the relevance and dynamics of these perceptions by checking for the impact on that sector of non-Jewish imperial German society where we would least expect it to have gained ground, social democracy, second international. Yeah. Okay, his doctoral thesis is this uh, subject, social democratic responses to anti-Semitism and the Judenfrage in Imperial Germany. Case study, okay, doctoral student, okay. Thank you very much for your acknowledgements. And we will leave that for those who wish to read them. And we will progress. Anchronyms. Oh, my. Okay. Okay. Social democracy stands on anti-Semitism and the specter of philo-Semitism. Yes. Philo-Semitism is another form of anti-Semitism. Yeah, this will probably get explained. Just a moment, I have to get a drink of water. Which is just over here, next to my next to my made of uh, pickled cucumbers. Okay. The social democratic response to anti-Semitism in effect amounted to playing va bank. What does that mean? This was not recognized, though, for the simple reason that the game was supposedly being played with a double safety net. The first ostensible, ostensible safety net was afforded by the following assumption. Not only the much discussed unpleasant traits ascribed to jury, but ultimately all features distinguishing Jews from non-Jews merely reflected a specific socioeconomic constellation and Jewry's role and status within that constellation. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, like, you know, Jew Jewish people being forbidden to own land so they couldn't live in the country. Side couldn't be farmers. Yes, they had to find some other way to live, like shopkeepers or money transfer or import-export. Since historical progress would render the, this particular associate economic constellation obsolete, all the features currently still setting Jewry apart, and thus Jewry itself as a distinct entity, would become equally obsolete and consequently disappear. The assumption offering the second ostensible safety net was this. Antisemitism could only take hold among specific strata of society. <laughs> which sections of society would take to anti-Semitism could again be defined in socioeconomic terms. Those whose livelihoods and economic activities were becoming increasingly incompatible with emerging fully-fledged 
capitalist economy responded with a cryptic form of anti-capitalist protest in the form of anti-Semitism, you know, like the aristocracy, for example. Yet, once their form of economic existence had been rendered entirely obsolete, these strata would also disappear altogether, just as the Jews would. You know, the peasantry would be susceptible to this kind of phenomenon as well. If Jewry and antisemitism were both destined to disappear as history progressed, according to the Marxists, the whole issue was obviously, at best, a transient one. And the only substantial problem with antisemitism was its ability to muddy the waters. Yet, reality itself would solve this problem. Mehring, for one, was convinced that all the healthy elements currently in the anti-Semites' thrall would, in the end, invariably cling to the rock that was the working class, which for, was for him, needless to say, was not a sociological, but a political category, as if the working class couldn't be anti-Semitic. <laughs> in fact, it was just as well that they did not try to clamber onto that rock at an earlier stage. After all, had all the ruined farmers and petty bourgeois individuals with their confused illusions gone over to social democracy right away, the party would have had a hard knock to crack, and might well be that all the theoretical instruction of the world would not have drummed economic dialectics into them as quickly as anti-Semitism will do as a result of its practical effectiveness. Huh. By practical effectiveness, he meant, of course, the exact opposite. The fact that none of the anti-Semites' prescriptions would ever be able to remedy the problems they claimed they could solve. Not only then would the inevitable course of development invariably rob anti-Semitism of its pre prerequisites, the Jews as a target and the social strata susceptible to it, while it still existed, it would also prove ineffective and therefore ultimately function as an additional eye-opener, underscoring yet further that socialism alone offered genuine solutions. Hmm. Yeah, sure. So no bother, no no bother to undertake any uh, action to to oppose anti-Semitism because it's all going to be solved by socialism, which is just around the corner, right? Okay. As already mentioned, those who publicly opposed the emerging political anti-Semitism in the eighteen seventies were promptly referred to by general consent as philo-Semites even though calling them non-anti-Semites or anti-anti-Semites would have been far more accurate. So this is like uh, saying, you know, that by opposing anti-Semitism, one must be loving the Jewish people. <laughs> that reminds me and you probably of the uh, racist uh, claim that if you are opposed to slavery, then you must be a end lover. <laughs> yeah, same thing. As is well known, not least from Abraham Kahan's recollections of the International Socialist Congress in Brussels in 1991, opposition to this philo-Semitism was certainly popular with French socialists, where the French Communist Party comes from. Moreover, as Kahan re uh, recalled, the leading German Social Democrat, Paul Singer, from 1844 to 1911, and the leader of the Austrian Party, Victor Adler, 1852-1918, both themselves of Jewish extraction, vehement, vehemently pleaded with him to withdraw his anti-antisemitic motion at the Congress in Brussels to avoid a showdown. They made it perfectly clear that he would, under no circumstances, let themselves be forced into a position where they might be seen to defend Jews or the Jewish people. Hence, in the event they raised no objections, to say the least, to the International Congress's final, final resolution, which was then directed with equal emphasis, as the resolution put it, against both anti-Semitic and philo-Semitic incitement. <laughs> to oppose anti-Semitism is considered to be incitement. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like saying that, you know, being anti-Zionist, you know, is like an incitement and it's upsetting the Jewish students, you know, and therefore the encampments had to be taken down and arrested because it might upset one or two Jewish students who were Zionists. Yeah, same thing. <laughs> and that's in the Social Democratic Party. Okay. Ultimately, 
philosemitism was in fact assumed by some to be made of more solid stuff than anti-Semitism. Meiring certainly was in no doubt as to which was the more daunting foe. The, the, he says, the brutalities committed against the Jews by anti-Semitism in words rather than deeds should not lead us to lose sight of the brutalities philotus, philosemitism commits in deeds rather than words against anyone, be he Jew or Turk, Christian or pagan, who resists capitalism. He wrote in 1991 in a much-cited formulation. For as he went on to explain, philosemitism opposes anti-Semitism only to the extent that anti-Semitism opposes capitalism. Anti-Semitism is capitalism, avec phrase. Philosemitism, however, is capitalism sans phrase, sans phrase. Huh. Meiring's case is practically instructive, particularly instructive, because here we know for sure that in other instances we can only infer, namely, that his appropriation of the philosemitism discourse took place before he became a socialist. It in fact transpired when he was a rabid anti-socialist. It cannot, therefore, by any stretch of the imagination, be the outflow of a specifically Marxist critique of capitalism. Hmm. We, knew the, we know this for sure because of a rather remarkable incident in 1891 related by Thomas Hoyle, the biographer of the early Mayring, who essentially accepted Mayring's own point of view on the matter. In that year, Mayring was publicly accused of having, at one and the same time, written pro-Semitic articles for the Volkszeitung, and anti-Semitic ones in the Sayal Zeitung, which was untrue on both counts. Meiring subsequently refuted the senseless, senseless attack concerning pro- and anti-Semitism by offering a comparison of relevant articles demonstrating, as he saw it, that he had formulated the same stance throughout. Yet, as Meiring himself pointed out, I admit that this evidence is not entirely conclusive, because the indictment might actually be taking issue with my perfectly reticent objections to certain philosemitic excesses. Which articles had he chosen to compare? He wrote, of the incidentally only very few strongly anti-Semitic articles I wrote for the Selizointa, I have chosen the one that led to a boycott of the paper by Jewish subscribers and advertisers, and which one might therefore assume to be the most strongly anti-Semitic of them all. As he hesitated to add, it also epitomizes the general attitude of that paper to the Jewish question. Oh, let me have a little drink here. Hmm. By contrast, of the, again, very few articles on, the, on anti-Semitism that I published in the Volkszeitung, he admits that they were anti-Semitic. I do not want to focus on the one that led in 1886 to a boycott of the paper by Jewish subscribers and advertisers because it was not by me, and I merely published it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, merely published it. Okay. The context here is a polemical one, of course, and Mehring's mood clearly defiant. Even so, the way in which he himself introduced the fact that he had, on two occasions, once directly and once indirectly, caused Jewish boycott calls against papers for which he was working is surely remarkable. Far from being a source of soul-searching or contrition for him, these boycott calls obviously struck him as veritable badges of honor. There's a footnote here about his path to socialism that you can go back to if you want. But I really couldn't care less. What then of the comparison he offered? The article he chose from the Sayel Zeitung was one written in September 1881 when he was a militant anti-socialist. It dealt with the extensive, or in his eyes, not so extensive, anti-Jewish unrest that swept his home province of Camarania that, that year. In this article, he claims that the philo-Semitic incitement of the local papers 
carries a considerable degree of responsibility for such an arrest, as did actually occur, and then stated, we hope that the Saale Zeitung will continue to uphold its established and upright stand, respecting every honest and decent person, be he Christian, Jew, Turk, or whatever else, but also denouncing every form of mendacity and deceit, every instance of usury, not only when Jew when they are committed, not only when they are committed by Germans or Turks, but also when they are committed by Jews. Oh. Again, we meet the Turks as a rhetorical device deployed by Mayor Ring to emphasize the alleged equanimity and detachment of his approach. Yet the Turks promptly disappear from the equation again when it comes to what Mayor Ring would have us believe is the actual alternative here. Neither incitement against Jews nor Jewish domination, the same rights for all citizens, that is a straightforward and unambiguous credo, which is entirely in keeping with liberalism and is equally opposed to Philo and anti-Semitic incitement. The article from the Volkszeitung that he offered in comparison was one published in November 1890, a time when Mehring, now a respected left liberal publicist, had already, already fallen from grace with the publishers of the Volkszeitung, and he was on the verge of defecting to social democracy. This article offered no more than a conventional critique of the leading Christian social anti-Semite, Adolf Stoichre, without as much as an allusion to philo-Semitism. In fact, then, Mehring could equally well have argued that he had abandoned his anti-philo-Semitic commitment and that the latter text differed from the early one, not only out of hypocrisy, but because he had changed his mind. Yet nothing could have been further from Mehring's mind. Having contrasted a Jewish, a juicy anti philo Semitic rant with a tame anti anti Semitic text without even a hint at the existence of philo Semitism, he nonetheless reached the somewhat stunning conclusion that, as one can see in all instances, I weave the same thread. Okay, the claim is mind boggling enough. More important for our discussion, though, is this writing in 1891 at the very juncture at which he was finally becoming a social democrat, Mehring himself not only published material clearly demonstrating that he acquired his anti philo in the period of his militant anti-socialism, but also used the opportunity to publicly reaffirm his commitment to this anti philo This is all the more remarkable given that he himself pointed it out, as we saw, that it was presumably this anti philo that had been misconstrued as anti-Semitism by his critiques, by his critics in the first place. He now maintained that his anti-philo-Semitism in the very form in which he had expressed it, while still an embittered opponent of socialism, was free of any ambiguity that would justify its categorization as ultimately anti-Semitic. Thus, we have Mehring's own word for it, that his Marxist anti-philo-Semitism was identical with his pre-Marxist and anti-socialist anti-philosemitism, and that his appropriation of Marxism required no modification of this anti-philosemitism. On the other hand, the fact that Mayring was able to publish his anti-philosemitic trance in a solid uh, national liberal, liberal paper as the Salazaitum is noteworthy in its own right. It gives a clear indication that anti philo was by no means a preserve of the socialist left, but acceptable to mainstream liberals too. Ah. Okay, I need another bit of water here. Now, Mehring's obsession or preoccupation with the inequities of philo Semitism is undeniable and invariably leads to far reaching ambiguity in all of his anti Semitic, all of his anti anti Semitic utterances. utterances. Uh, excuse me for my, uh, for my blockages in English. I don't uh, live in English anymore. I, I, I speak in French all the time every day with everyone. I don't, 
I, I, I know very few uh, Anglophones with whom I communicate. So, uh, and I'm reading this text for the first time as well. So, uh, and also English is not my first language. Yiddish is. Manesh Sprache is Yiddish. So, uh, we will continue. In at least one hitherto two apparently unnoticed instance, this ambiguity even earned him the praise of periodical, whose sympathies for the anti-Semites was quite clear-cut, namely the weekly journal, the Grenzbotten, edited at the time by Johann Grunow. In a survey of the Social Democratic Press, in its 21st of April, 1892 edition, it remarked that an article in the Neue Zeit had aroused its unmitigated delight. The article in question discussed the case of Paul Marx, a journalist who had sued the most respectable of German papers, the Voissische Zeitung, for unfair dismissal, claiming that he had been sacked simply because he was of Jewish origin. The lessons from the affair that the article in Naya Zeit had discussed in a rather humorous fashion was that however strong the bond of Jewry's common interest, the bond of the capitalist interest was ultimately always stronger. And when the push came to shove, the former always gave way to the latter. Mehring had indeed argued that the fate of Paul Marx epitomized the philo-Semitic hypocrisy. The same political spectrum that ordinarily screamed blue murder when Jews became the victims of an anti-capitalist critique immediately sensed that in this particular case, a rather different principle was at stake. Never mind that the victim was a Jew. Every capitalist has the right to throw his slaves into the street when it suits him, and that's that. Consequently, Marx's case should prove particularly instructive for the honest anti-Semites, Mehring reasoned, those who due to an essentially honorable hatred for the moral hideousness of capitalism want to eliminate the Jews as the allegedly sole cause of that hideousness. Okay, time for a break here. So just before, the candles burn out, give you another image. Yeah, that's even better. No, I won't burn my beard. It's uh, far enough away. But you can see uh, my pious are not close enough to be burnt either. So that's that. Okay, let's continue with the reading. This is a thorough analysis of social democracy and subsequently of uh, of communism, communist ideology as well, you know, because communist uh, Marxist ideology comes from the Second International. Now I go back to share. It hardly seems surprising that Mehring, social democrat, has generally been singled out either as someone whose utterances revel, reveal in a particularly illuminating manner the tactical and ideological dilemmas confronting the labor movement in the 1890s and the difficulty in demarcating the Marxist from the anti-Semitic critique of liberal capitalism or as an outright special case. In part, this notion hinges on a quantitative argument. No other socialist wrote as extensively on the Jewish question as did Mehring, nor, we might add, did any of his peers address the inequities of philosemitism as extensively, persistently, and with as much vitriol. It has become widely accepted that the extent Persistence and heftiness of this coverage was directly proportionate to the strength of his obsession with the matter. Yet this line of argument disregards the fact that few of his peers wrote as extensively on any issue 
as did Mayring on this one, or others for that matter. Nor did he criticize other phenomena with any less contempt. This issue is worth exploring in a little detail. Here's the footnotes. <clears throat> the two leading social democrats who produced comparable quantities of relatively high quality journalistic work were Kautsky and Bernstein. Yes. <clears throat> Just a moment. Yet their situation differed from Mayring's in several relevant and telling ways. Throughout the 90s, when the bulk of Mayring's particularly problematic articles on anti-Semitism and philo-Semitism were written, Kautsky, as the de facto editor-in-chief of the Neuzeit, New Times, lived in Stuttgart, while Bernstein, due to the prosecution pending in Germany for its illegal activities during the Sozialisten Gesetzt was struck in, stuck in uh, London. So he was responsible for some sort of um, a socialist uprising. Kautsky was particularly tied down by administrative duties and focused mainly on theoretical and especially economic issues. Bernstein concentrated particularly on theoretical issues and the international movement. Both were at liberty to contribute articles on current affairs if and when they saw fit. Yet, unlike Mehring, neither of them was the Berlin correspondent of the journal and thus compelled to churn out editorials on a weekly basis that unlocked the deeper meaning of current events in the city that was both the empire's capital and a major focal point of anti-Semitic activism. Given the heavy journalistic workload he shouldered, it is perhaps a little wonder that Mehring recycled what he had to be his, what he held to be his expertise in any given field whenever possible. Once he had taken on a certain issue for whatever reason, his readers were highly unlikely ever to hear the last of it. His determination to spell out what he held to be the implications of Marxism for as many aspects of life as possible was thus compounded by his habit of relentlessly recycling, at least for reasons of pure expediency. Ideas and issues he felt he had at some point managed to formulate rather aptly. The likes of Bernstein, Kautsky, and the party's uncontested leader during the first half centuries of its existence, August Bebel, Bebel 1840 to 1913, tended to comment on anti-Semitism on fairly rare occasions and more or less carefully chosen contexts. Generally, these utter utterances were instantly recognizable as pronouncements of grave ideological significance. Mehring's relevant remarks, by contrast, popped up throughout the huge corpus of his various writings in his most banal and his most respectable texts alike. Consequently, they were often likely to catch the readers ideologically at ease or off guard. This would have placed Mehring in an exceptionally good position to challenge prevalent misconceptions, had he wanted to do so. One might therefore argue that he bears a particular responsibility for, in fact, doing the exact opposite. He obviously enjoyed spelling out, deftly and with verb, verve, what tended to remain abstract ideological formulations in the relevant pronouncements of his peers that his peers were usually rather more reticent in spelling out in detail what they thought were the implications of the party's official stance on anti-Semitism and the Jewish question is beyond doubt. Yet does, that does not automatically allow us to surmise that their formulations, had they actually tried to explicate those implications in greater detail, would have been any more pal palatable to us than the ones mirroring actually came up with. Okay, I think that's enough for now. I'll come back with this uh, next Shabbos or another time. This is something we have to pursue. Okay, now stop the share. Let's see what other comments can be made for this week. 
So Netanyahu came to the USA to be expected, you know, whatever he said there. Oh, yes, Iran is responsible for everything. And uh, the Zionist state is responsible for nothing. Yes, that's clear. But in Canada, one of one of the most complicit countries in the world with the Zionist genocide in Gaza, the Canada Revenue Agency just deregistered the major Zionist charitable organization, the Jewish National Fund, the JNF. And for a couple of decades, we've been trying to get it deregistered because it is not a charitable organization. It supports militaristic pursuits and uses occupied lands, for instance, at Canada Park near Jerusalem. So that's something to be noted this week, very important. Camilla Harris, the presumptive uh, presidential nominee, is feeling the pressure from the protest movement and is uh, starting to crack. We'll see how far this cracking goes, but she's certainly not worthy of any vote. Dr. Jill Stein, on the other hand, is a Jewish anti-Zionist who even got arrested you know, at a protest demonstration this fall, no, this spring. So, you know, it's clear Dr. Cornell West is, is also another choice when available. So any alternative like Dr. Jill Stein, Cornell West, or a socialist candidate would be appropriate to use a vote for in the United States, but not the uh, bourgeois democratic parties. For those who don't think voting means anything, you know, go vote anyway, because we need Jill Stein and Cornell West, you know, to take two to 5% to a, so as to uh, strip away the absolute majority that either candidate is going to claim in order to be, uh, to claim to be representative of a uh, majority of Americans. If they don't get a majority, they're not representative of a majority of Americans, you know, they're not gonna get a majority because Je Dr. Jill Stein and Dr. Cornell West are gonna take it away from them. So if they don't represent the majority of the Americans, then they have to listen to the protests, right? Yeah. Well. Even though they don't want to, they will have to. So that's this week, together with the massacre every single day that's taken place. Okay, the occupation has been denounced as illegal by the International Court of Justice. The opinion is being referred back to the General Assembly of the United Nations, which had requested such a legal opinion in the first place. So a legal opinion is required as a precedent to taking legal action. Now the legal action is open for sanctions against Israel, peacekeeping forces, you know, to be placed into Gaza to stop the assault, peacekeeping forces in the West Bank as well. And I mean peacekeeping forces, not from Saudi Arabia, but from like Turkey, not from Great Britain, not so Great Britain, no way. Uh, from the United States of America, no, no, has to be, and uh, you know, like it can't be Saudi Arabia, <laughs> you know. So, okay, fit everything else into place, you know. I would choose Algeria actually, and China. Yeah, that would do the trick. Okay, so that's uh, the uh, Vanguard Circle. Uh, em uh, diffusion for for this week and uh we continue on as the jewish socialist bund and we take note of the fact that uh any serious uh jewish thought on the matter of zionism is picking up one one this concept after another until finally we can rebuild the bund and make it into an effective force that actually replaces the zionist imposed dictatorial leadership over the jewish people at this point we will take over and be respected as the legitimate Jewish leadership and not Zionism, which arises from uh, Protestant Christianity. As Samuel said, we are not a nation like other nations. We are not. We are the Jewish people. We are a Jewish nation. Am Yisrael Chai Hamedinet Velo Yisrael. That means the Jewish people uh, Long live the Jewish people and 
the state is not Israel. Israel is the Jewish people. That's the name of the Jewish people originally. That was stolen by the Zionists to be used as a name for a state. Okay, that's it. That's all for today. This has been Dr. Abraham Weisfeld, PhD in political science from the University of Quebec and Montreal. Get Chavez uh, to everybody, uh, to the monde. And uh, we look forward to your comments, and I will reply to every single comment. <laughs>